Welcome to Terp Talks. I'm your host, Rob Clark. Just to catch you up to speed, most recent publication is Cannabis, Evolution and Ethnobotany, written with Mark Merlin from the University of Hawaii and published by University of California Press. It's now out in paperback, so you can get one for less than 50 bucks. So get on Amazon and give it a go. All right. Now today we're going to talk about terpenes. Terpenes, terpenoids, or also known as terps. Not turpentine, but terpenes. Um, terpenes are produced by many, many plants. They're produced in the foliage and the fruits of, of myriad of plants. An orange peel, for instance, when you bend the outside, you see the little squirts coming out of essential oil. That's predominantly terpenes. Um, cannabinoids, which are a closely related set of compounds, are produced by cannabis plants, hence the name cannabinoids. Um, cannabis plants also produce a host of terpenes. Well, well over 100 of them have been identified, and there's probably many more in trace amounts. The terpenes are contained in glandular trichomes. They're on the surface of the plant, they're on a stalk, and they have a head that contains the, the uh, essential oils that contain the terpenes and the cannabinoids. Um, when hashish is made, or when we squeeze a bud, or do something that creates the smell to be released, we're breaking these trichome heads. When hashish is made, the trichome head comes off the stalk, and the terpenoids and the cannabinoids are still contained within. So that's why hashish also has a nice aroma. If we just leave these alone and don't disturb them, don't break them, there's much less uh, aroma being released. Now, the aroma is trapped inside of a jar. So this is a, a standard, now rather old-fashioned way, but still works, to keep uh, cannabis flowers, dried flowers. This is a lovely big sir holy flower. You can smell when you open the jar. There's, there's outgassing of terpenes. You smell the terpenes in the drying room. You smell them in the grow room. You smell them on a breezy day outside. This is the little terpenes being disturbed and releasing their aromas. Some of these aromas also just leak out slowly, uh, naturally, too. Hmm, smells wonderful. A big Sir Holy Bud. This one has uh, terpenoline and pinene are the two predominant terpenes. When I say that, I'm alluding to different varieties having different aromas. And in fact, the aromas are, are really the, the trademark, the brand of a variety. People pick them up and smell them before they smoke them or eat them. Um, this is the way people just identify varieties, really. Um, sometimes the varieties represent the aromas or flavors, strawberry cough, for instance, or something like that. Um, these individual flavors, like perfumes, are a blend of different terpenes. This um, Big Sur Holy Weed, the predominant terpene is terpenoline. It's found in hazes, Jack Herrera, train wrecks, things like this. They all have a common aroma to them. The other one's pinene, named after the pine tree, where it was originally discovered. So it has a piney aroma. But this suite of terpenes, there are also 10 or 15 other ones in there, or maybe more that are in very small amounts. And like a perfume, it's this combination of these ingredients that's important. Not any individual one so much. The individual ones all have separate aromas, and they all have separate influences. So that's what I want to shift to now. Let's talk about getting high. You have THC. That's the primary cannabinoid that people seek in uh, medicinal and uh, adult use cannabis. Um, it's the compound that makes us high, delta-9, tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. The other one you hear a lot about these days is cannabidiol, or CBD. This is non-psychoactive, in the traditional sense at least. It doesn't cause uh, euphoria and, and effects like that. It does uh, have a medicinal effect, but through largely different pathways than, than THC. So it's non-psychoactive. Um, there are other cannabinoids as well. And I'll give you a little history here. 
we thought that the, initially, everyone thought that the ver variations in the cannabinoids, and there's 60 plus found in cannabis, um, half a dozen that are found relatively frequently, but all of them in small amounts excepting THC and CBD. Um, we originally thought that the, the different cannabinoids produce different highs, and therefore the different varieties of, of marijuana had different effects because of these variations in the cannabinoids. When you express variations in multiple compounds in a plant, we talk about the profile. And this comes a bit from the graphs we get from GCs and, and other analysis gear that give you spikes. It looks a bit like mountain peaks, and they're even called peaks. That's sort of a profile, if you will, a landscape of how the, the different aromatic and psychoactive, non-psychoactive cannabinoids, how they're arranged in the plant. What's the maximums, the occurrence of different ones, and the maximums and minimums of each one. So it's a profile. We're never talking about a single compound. There are always many different compounds within, a, within any marijuana sample. So we thought initially that it was variations in the cannabinoids that made variations in the effects. Then there were surveys in the mid-90s um, of medical, medicinal cannabis available in California, for instance. And those surveys, those chemical analyses, showed that they all contained varying amounts of THC, and hardly any of them contained any CBD, and really only traces of the other cannabinoids, so little. Then we began to experiment with the pure cannabinoids and realized that THC is really the only psychoactive one, but it's boring. It's tasteless, odorless, colorless, flat, boring. Makes you stoned, has good medicinal effects. But it's not what you feel from marijuana. What is it then? Well, we, it was right under our noses the whole time. It's obviously the variations in the aromatic principles, which are primarily terpenes. Um, and it all ties together. You have the flavor profile, the aroma profile, that is the brand name, the brand indicator, really, of uh, whatever variety you're looking for and whatever effect you're looking for. Then you have that in concert with the THC, which is the active medical ingredient. ingredient and then those are all combined together into a flower. So, it's variations in the terpenes, which on their own are not psychoactive. Um, one, at least, caryophylline, is known to bind to the cannabinoid receptors, the CB1 receptor, the one that actually influences how you get high. Um, the other ones have, have largely not been tested. They may or may not bind to the, uh, to the CB receptors, but neither does cannabidiol. So things can have medicinal and positive effects without binding to the endocannabinoid system. Um, the terpenes definitely modify the otherwise um, empty and boring THC. The terpenes are what make us high. The terpenes are what we're really after once we have something that has enough THC to satisfy the potency level you're looking for. And that's what's really interesting about them. Um, there are ways to experiment these days. There are new products that are fascinating. You can now buy isolated terpenes from other sources besides cannabis, but naturally derived. So you can learn about each one individually and blend them a little and play. Um, there, the hashish oils, weed oils that are around now, um, usually called distillate or something like that, they're almost pure THC. They don't have any terpenes in them. The terpenes have been stripped out during the uh, extraction process of the THC. So you have almost pure THC. You have the terpenes that you can add back to it. And you can also, these terpenes are food grade. So in some instances, you can eat them without the THC, but you can eat if you're an edibles person. You can learn the effects of the different terpenes apart from the THC. Then you can combine them. This is a great way to learn about our own minds and bodies, to learn about how these different things affect us, and especially good for medicinal users, so you can find what you really need. 
Then when you go to a dispensary, now that there are so many analysis labs and any responsible dispensary should have profiles there of what your medicine contains, you should be able to target what you really need in your medicine. So this is a great way to do science on ourselves. So instead of waiting for things to be funded and read about it much later. So that's kind of cool. If you want to learn a bit more about terpenes and a bit about hashish, this is another book I wrote quite a while ago, back in 1998. Still available, um, limited copies available. It may go out of print pretty soon, so you might want to grab one. Um, hashish has, it talks about the history and culture and the making of hashish and how to make traditional hashishes. It doesn't cover the oils particularly. But in the back is a handy, a handy uh, appendix that contains all kinds of information about terpenes. So this might, uh, their boiling points, different bits of technical data about them, which might be of interest to you. So I guess that's about it. You know, enjoy your terps. They're, they're, when you're using these uh, individual compounds, be careful. They're highly solvent, many of them. They vaporize very easily, so don't leave the lid off the bottle. Um, and use them in tiny, tiny amounts. There are a lot of spiked products these days, vape pens in particular, where people, companies take the THC, the, the, the basic oil, and add back to it different flavors. And this is the wave of the future in, in a lot of ways. But most of them are heavy-handed. Um, they put too much of the flavoring agent in there. And they are aggressive compounds. If you're doing them on a nail or doing experiments like that, be very, very careful. You can uh, breathe vaporized things that normally in cannabis would be in tiny, tiny amounts. The essential oil is usually less than 5% of the weight of a dry flower, you know, and that's a lot of different terpenes to make that up. So you really be careful with them. That's all I'm saying. They're, uh, they're fun to experiment with, but don't overdo it. Otherwise, it's solvent abuse, not uh, learning about cannabis. So there are terpenes in other plants also. Yes. Um, is there research, or do you think there will be research on combining different plants or foods, say, uh, uh, for their terpene effects with certain strains of cannabis, say eating strawberries with uh, another uh -huh. type of yes. uh, cannabis, for instance. Possibly so. There's uh, evidence, uh, you see it on the internet a lot, that uh, mangoes contain myrcene. Myrcene is a very, very common, but probably the most common terpenoid in cannabis. Um, it's also found in the hop plant, which is a very close relative of cannabis, the only real near relative. Um, myrcene is found in mangoes, and it's um, sometimes attributed as being the couch lock effect. So yes, maybe if you had pure THC and ate a lot of mangoes, you might have a couch lock effect with your pure THC instead of doing some other fruit with it that might or breathing some other terpene that might uh, give you a stimulating effect. So far, the pairings like this haven't been looked at too much, but it'd be a very interesting, uh, very interesting field of research. Yes, you mentioned it's in hot plants, so you yeah. could maybe start pairing various beers with I various cannabis strains. I am a fan of, of the hop plant, and it's uh, most common use of bittering and preserving agent in beer. It's really what it was intended for. And hop is in there for two reasons. The primary reason, much like the primary reason we use cannabis is for the THC, the primary reason you use hops are for uh, alpha, bitter alpha acids, they're called. They're bittering agents. And the alpha acids, uh, the humul humulone and these, these compounds, were preservative. And, and they're bitter also, but that's where the bitter tastes come into beers. But the hop cone also contains lots and lots of terpenes. And you notice now a real trend in uh, West Coast brewing here in North America has been really hoppy beers. The IPAs lead the pack because they were heavily hopped to preserve them on the travel to India from England. So that's how that began. And now this has become a real trend here on the West Coast. Now, it may just be a coincidence, but the West Coast is the home of cannabis in North America. It really began in California and Oregon and Washington and all the way to Alaska before it appeared in a lot of other places. So the West Coast has been it. Now we have several thousand microbreweries on the West Coast. 
and highly hopped beers are all the rage. So maybe this is back to a basic taxonomic relationship between cannabis and humulus, between the hemp and the hop. But anyway, it remains to be seen. But that might be a pairing in action right there, people supplementing their terpene content by drinking really hoppy beers. They might even enjoy a little weed with that. So, yeah. Um, you also talked a little bit about people uh, mixing various terpenes for medicinal mm. reasons. Uh, so does that seem like a good future uh, goal for medical research to find out which terpenes work specifically for certain diseases uh, well with cannabis? Absolutely, since that is the real variation between uh, the different cultivars and the different dry flowers you can find in dispensaries, then of course, that makes perfect sense. You, you need to have the primary medicinal ingredient, THC or CBD, or possibly another cannabinoid, in the amounts you need for your condition, but then the, the terpenes modify it to make it more appropriate and more effective. And we don't really understand how this works yet, but it's becoming quite obvious that this is the case. We've run out of other variables. You know, this is, and, and the terpenes are so variable. They're, they're so various. They're so um, wide, widespread and of uh, a whole range of boiling points and molecular shapes. And it, it's, it's a complex field that can be looked into much more, I think. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Very good, very good. Good to speak to you. See you next time. Go ahead. And by way of honorifics for those who make the life possible, for Mojave, for the flowers, and for Will, for the Kandama, I promise I'll put it back together, bro. See you soon. How about your backdrop? Oh, yes, and of course, we have the, uh, the ancient hearth here at the... Uh, Turner Mansion, yeah, pretty cool. Local granite, very nice. Stone.